the Bachelor of Sociología and San Clemen, uh, a PhD by the University of Autonomous Barcelona, in uh, something that has to do with detection of shapes in uh, soft surfaces. Uh, she's a full professor at the University of Barcelona. She has an IKEA academia. Uh, is a senior researcher in the uh, image analysis unit. And uh, she's a member of the ELIS and uh, unit from Barcelona. Uh, she's also founder of at least one company, and uh, uh, has a number of partners. So she has pretty active in this. Uh, very interesting type of activity. Also on the social type of activities, so the community type of activities is uh, historic the Plan National Investigation Scientific Investigation Ciencias. She's editor of the main journals in image analysis and uh, and also is part and organizer of the different masters, including master of Artificial intelligence at the University of Mexico, Polytechnic of Barcelona. Uh, the, the name of the group is uh, Computer Vision and uh, Automatic Level. Although that sounds now tremendously, uh, 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 a tremendous authority, uh, very, very current interesting, but the name. As a moment has been there before, being so uh, popular. I would say. So, we are, um, as I'm sure, in Spain, so we've been working in different areas of artificial intelligence and the more classical fields, a lot of applications in the medical domain, in the biomedical domain, too. And now she's more interested in the Sophia type of activities. And yes, I find it also very interesting. So, we are very happy to have uh, her here. The idea we managed to solve the last few details on the uh, Bureaucratic side is that she would be a joint group between the University of Barcelona and the Barcelona Supercomputer Center. As many of you may know, from the very beginning that I uh, came to, to the BSC six years ago, I wanted to have a group in this area, general area of uh, vision or image analysis. Uh, it's taken six years, but that but maybe there uh, in some point, so we are very happy to have the uh, help here and to look for a common bright future. Thank you for coming here. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome today. Uh, do you hear me in class? Okay, good. Thank you very much uh, for your interest. Um, today, it, it will be a little bit uh, uh, unusual talk because it's not about some specific topic, some specific uh, area. I want today to make you a story so that everybody of you can pick a topic and we can have opportunity to talk later. So I, I will try to make several questions. To me, it's much more important to have the questions than the, and then we will look for the answer. So it will be one hour. Uh, <laughs> I really appreciate your question for this. Uh, as uh, Fonso said, thank you very much for inviting me. This is really a pleasure. Um, we, from the University of Barcelona, we always have been in some kind of contact, but uh, uh, now I think we have a great opportunity to, to do even much more things together. Um, as uh, Alfonso said, I'm head of the Consolidated Research Group. It was Computer Vision Machine Learning. Now it is called Artificial Intelligence Biomedical Applications. Um, okay, this should work. No. Okay, so today I want to go to four to uh, topics. First, who am I? And then speaking about deep learning, that is my main interest, uh, trends in our proposals, and then our current projects and success stories. Let's see, it was working. Okay. Okay, so uh, the Consolidated Research Group, uh, Artificial Intelligence Biomedical Applications, is formed by no nine doctors and more than 30 uh, PhD students and postdocs, and we are covering different topics on computer vision, machine learning, computer graphics, modeling, simulation, 
and healthcare and radionomics and biomedical applications. So a lot of activity are going, European projects. In fact, uh, <laughs> there are some nice collaboration uh, here with Barcelona Supercomputing, national project technology transfers, uh, fellows, publications, as, as what you do here. But oh, what is the common uh, denominator of all these people? At this moment, we are working mainly on deep learning. Okay. So my question here is, how many of you use deep learning? Okay. How many of you research on deep learning? Okay. Good. How many of you do not use deep learning? Okay. <laughs> so today we have the... Yeah. Sorry, can you share the screen with the people? Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah, show. Uh, share screen. Now, do you know? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. So I will try to explain my story, and I will. I hope that you also see what you can do with the learning, with machine learning and deep learning, and uh, what could be the interesting questions at this moment that are. Uh, on the on the on the top. <laughs> okay, so what happened to us is that we have been working on machine learning, deep learning, last more than twenty years. At some moment, what we found is that deep learning was not anymore something of computer science because I was speaking with people from faculty of medicine. They were using deep learning. I was speaking with astronomy. They were using with physicists, with biologists, even with sociologists or psychologists, they were using deep learning. So our question was, well, and so what are we doing? <laughs> so what shall we do? So we try to answer questions that go a little bit farther than just using deep learning. Uh, we were very nicely surprised that today even physicians, they are training their neural networks and they're applying to, to process their clinical data. So this is good because in this way we have common language. It is better to have common language to them, but also it says, okay, let's try to see what, what's our purpose and what was our main goal in, 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 at this moment in, the, in science. So we try to solve, we try to address different problems like uh, uh, going from model-centric to data-centric approaches. So it's not today question what is the yet another model? What is the yet another architecture? How to add a new layer? How to uh, 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 find the hyperparameters? So it has been shown by uh, some good scientists that today, if you have a closer look on our data, maybe we will improve our performance much more than trying to fine tune and to add another regularization term in the loss function, et cetera. So we are trying to ask questions like this, uh, to, to speak about uncertainty, about interpretability, about uh, generative AI, about fairness, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I will go like, back on this. But what was the beginning of uh, me? So many years ago, <laughs> just two years after the wall, uh, uh, the word wall, the German wall uh, fall down, uh, I began to do my master. So I could come to Spain. And the first time I was uh, touching medical image analysis was on applying at this moment image processing and computer vision techniques in order to analyze bones from radiographs. So if you see some people that are very tall or very short, uh, usually this for us, maybe it's well. Uh, but uh, we say, okay, that, that's it. But for people, this could be really, really a big problem, right? So uh, they really have very a lot of social problems to behave in the society. 
Uh, and in fact, this is not something that you cannot change. There are uh, some atlases that show that it is question of how the bones mature. So if uh, uh, kids uh, are considered at time uh, when they are in, in 12, 14 age, uh, um, they, then they receive some hormone and you can regulate the, the growth. And this is very important. So my first my approach to the approaching to the medical images was related to uh, uh, radiographs uh, segmentation. My second uh, project on medical images was in my PhD. Uh, when I began to work on interval ultrasound images, so when we see, when we say, okay, we should control our hamburger, hamburger hamburguesas, <laughs> our McDonald's, because cholesterol is going to our veins and our arteries. Uh, and when the cholesterol accumulates, so it obstructs the vessel. And when it obstructs the vessel, we have an angina or, or infarct. Uh, and the point is that usually still today, when people have heart uh, problems and cardio, uh, cardiovascular problems, they are they, they do, they go to the hospital and they have angiography. But in the angiography, you see, you don't see the vessel. You see that, uh, that the, the uh, blood that is going inside the vessel. So we don't know how much uh, plaque was accumulated. Okay? And uh, the only, the, one of the best techniques and very, very few techniques that is giving you possibility to see um, Okay, oh, no lesson. Uh, to see the plaque inside is through a catheter that introduces it through the, through the femur uh, artery, it goes to the, to the vessels. And from inside, you can see this plaque that is accumulated. You see what kind of plaque is, and then the physicians introduce a stent and then uh, inflate the stent and then open the, 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 the space for the plaque. Okay, so this was my thesis. It continued 10 years more after the thesis. I continued to work on this. This was a very nice collaboration with uh, people from German Street and Pujol from Badalona. Uh, we developed uh, several techniques uh, in order to measure the plug vessel, in order to do multimodal analysis, in order to see the vessel from inside that is given by this uh, ultrasound and also the uh, and geography that is giving a view from outside. And in this way, the physician could plan the intervention when they do the stent, when they put this stent inside the vessel and inflate it, they can easily see how the plaque is from inside and outside. And this, this work, um, also we analyze the stent, develop it algorithms, etc. So, Algorithms were very nice. They were working very nice. So we were collaborating also with Boston Scientific. This is a huge American company for catheters. And uh, with them, also we did the three technology transfers and uh, eight PhD students finished it after me on this topic. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, international publications and also three technology transfer to the, to the uh, American company. Uh, then next story was about wireless endoscopy. In the wireless endoscopy, so I don't know if you have seen this small wireless capsule. Yeah. So this wireless capsule, it what you see here in the back, I can. Okay. So what you see here, this is a small capsule. Like a pill and you swallow and it travels really. It has a camera in, in front and it has a battery and, uh, uh, on, the back, on the back. Uh, and it emits uh, in wireless way uh, images so that you have here some uh, 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 recording device and it is capturing all the tra trajectory during the travel of the capsule. And uh, what happened is that this, uh, in this project, the uh, physicians from Valdebran they had to analyze these images. Do you know how many images were you have when you have all this travel that is between eight and 24 hours? More than 60,000. So physicians had to evaluate 60,000 images in order to see what is the problem is 
side. And what is the problem inside is not only uh, not so much to find some specific uh, polyp or some ulcer, but to see if the intestine is behaving in the right way. What does it mean if the testing is behaving the right way? So the physician came to us and he said, I, I want to see how it contracts. And usually they are measuring, and today still in many hospitals, they are measuring by a pressure catheter. So when they put the pressure catheter and just see how there is changes of pressure. Of course, this is very, very pure, very poor uh, information. So for first time, they could see what happens in the small intestine with this capsule. And in this capsule, in these videos, you can see where there are contractions and how often they are, if they are focused, uh, they are concentrated on the first part of the small intestine, on the middle, in everywhere, etc. etc. So as usually happens, that you begin in some specific question, and then our we engineers and uh, scientists, we back, we return back knowledge and we begin making questions, new questions. So are only contractions interesting? Are the, the views of the contraction interesting? What about the dynamic, what about the anatomy of the intestine? What about the, uh, just to see how this is, uh, how this is static, etc., etc. So what happened is that then we were uh, creating a predictive model based on machine learning that is taking much more information than the original idea of the physician. And then we uh, collaborated with the company, given imaging that uh, lately but was acquired by Medtronic, and they in, uh, in, uh, introduced all these advances in the, in the capsule. So we came up with six PSD tests with 29 international patterns together with the company, uh, three technology transfers, and many international publications. Okay? So this was another 10 years. Other projects where we can see medical imaging uh, is interesting. For example, in this case, in this, is, this was a collaboration with the University of Rovere Virgili uh, from Tarragona. So he, here we have been uh, collaborating, and this is uh, the thesis of uh, Mustafa Kamal. He did apply the deep learning algorithms in order to uh, analyze the melanoma and to the, the, the discriminate melanoma from other tumors in the, in the skin. So here again, we applied the deep learning techniques. It, in fact, it was at this time, 2016, 2017, it was, we were second in the international challenge. This is very, very important to go to international challenges in order to see where you, where we are. Uh, okay, and now he continues uh, his uh, research career in UK. This is another project with the Eurocat. In Eurocat, we were collaborating with uh, uh, with uh, the Department of Health. And uh, here we have been using um, um, the deep learning in order to detect uh, and characterize lung nodes in the in, in lung. And then COVID came and then we decided, okay, we should work for COVID, right? <laughs> like everybody. So we also applied our deep learning models in order to, uh, uh, um, to analyze the lesions in, in the city in COVID. Uh, for COVID patients. And this is another collaboration. This is uh, here we are working uh, uh, with, uh, within the European project uh, that is led by Karim Lekadir uh, from our group. And here we are using uh, deep learning algorithms in order to segment the, the different uh, uh, cancer uh, formations in breast cancer imaging. Okay. This is a Mikai uh, publication from 2022. Uh, okay, and then I make uh, my uh, question. Okay, uh, of course, today there is no doubt that artificial intelligence, machine learning, computer vision is very important for medical image analysis, but I was a little bit like tired of yet another CT, yet another um, MR, yet another uh, breast uh, mammography, etc. etc. And I was thinking, okay, is there a, a different way to also to use artificial intelligence in order to help people in their well-being. And then at this time, 10 years ago, there was a wearable camera. This was very nice wearable camera. And uh, we thought, okay, maybe with wearable camera, we can do something 
And if we put this wearable camera, it's taking pictures. So it takes in two pictures per minute. But during the day, you can see completely what I have been doing. And sometimes I was asking, where is my time going? <laughs> I don't know if you have the same question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I wanted to see, okay, during my day, how much time I spent on readings, how much time I spent on, on transport, how much time I spent on, on, on talking with somebody or working. Um, okay, so it was very nice technology. Uh, we were creating a very nice neural net, uh, neural net uh, human network uh, with collaborators all over the world. Even we had a very nice collaboration with people from New Zealand. So I had to go to work in New Zealand for a month. <laughs> it was very nice uh, experience there because they were using wearable cameras in order to analyze obesity in kids, in children. So you see a, 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 a kid with a big wearable camera. And I was, wow, because it was time of GDPR. Okay, so GDPR did a lot. <laughs> for the moment. Uh, and then we realized that we cannot use wearable cameras on all on, on, on places. Okay. Anyway, we got a marathon. A marathon, it was a very nice project. Uh, this was collaboration with Consorio Sanitario de Terraza, where we show that such kinds of cameras are very important, for example, for people with mild cognitive impairment. Because people with mild cognitive impairment, this is third stage of Alzheimer's. So they, these people, they still are autonomous. They can live alone at home, okay? But their Alzheimer's is going on. So the purpose here was, is there a way that technology is helping us to delay the process? And in this project, what we developed a serious game where we were using images, autobiographic images acquired by the camera. And with these images, we created cognitive exercises. And when the person was using these uh, episodic images for cognitive exercise, because he was at the same time remembering his, his story, he was putting emotions. And if you put emotions, the intervention is much more uh, reliable. So it was very nice. We did, in fact, we even gained the crash European uh, grant, but then GDPR stopped this. So this is also important to know is that because sometimes engineers, we are very excited to do something. We are very excited when we see technology. Wow, I can do this and this and this. And you spend a lot of time and maybe you finish and you have an excellent product. But if the conditions are not proper to use it, you, spend, you, you lost a lot of time. So <laughs> this is also second second side uh, lesson from my side. So, but this time, what we saw is that also one of the things that was interesting for us was that we, are, we had information, for example, about nutrition. And then we asked ourselves, okay, uh, when we speak about uh, 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 healthy habits, we speak about basically uh, uh, physicians, they simplify to um, nutrition, exercises, no stress, uh, well relaxed, and, and, and few things more. So what we thought is, okay, for, for activities, I have a lot of apps. Yeah, I have apps on my phone. Even if I don't know, I, there is something that is counting my steps. So automatically I can go recover this information and see how much I moved uh, or, or didn't in the last week. But I don't have any way to register my nutrition. I don't know uh, how to know how, how I, I uh, uh, eat, in fact. Do you know how nutritionists do this? They might ask you to do food diaries. So you should have a paper, you should write in the morning, I got a croissant. What croissant? With chocolate or integral croissant? Uh, I took my coffee with milk. What kind of milk? Did you put two drops of milk or, or you have a big um, <laughs> cup of milk? So they are doing uh, food diaries. And because people are lazy, we are lazy, they, we skip, we forget to do. We don't have time to do food diaries. So the alternative is to do food questionnaires. So you go to the physician, to the nutrition, and nutrition asks you, 
how much how many times did you uh, get x this month how many times did you get paella how many times did you get croissants and you will say i got three croissants <laughs> okay so this is still today and if there is nutritionist in the in the, in the room please <laughs> to forget me but this is still today uh, actually so what we decided is okay we can do and we can analyze food because we have it in our phones how many of you notice it when always when you go to a restaurant somebody gets the phone and make a picture okay so if you go to many people to the photos in, in our phones we are automatically know if i like cheesecake or i like very nice ice cream with strawberry so the idea is okay we can use this technology we can use some kind of technology in order to know how people eat now is food image recognition a challenge <laughs> if i ask you for example what is this or, or even some simple, what is this? Maybe it's jamon, no? <laughs> Maybe it's um, carpaccio. Maybe it's um, tomato, right? So this is really a challenge, right? So what is this? Maybe it's pasta but maybe it's kind of sepia, right? So we thought, well, today everybody speak about deep learning. And in deep learning are able to make cars go autonomously on the street, it's not possible that deep learning is not helping us to recognize the fault, okay? So if we are able to do this, we can help a lot to people in their nutrition. Okay, uh, to nutrition is to register better what they are patient do. Okay, and we said we should go for deep learning. It's not possible today. Deep learning, if you read, deep learning are better in cancer detection. It's they are better than human experts. We, uh, today you read that uh, deep learning is better in melanoma detection. Today they are better in in, in narrow image analysis and cancer detection, uh, and even today we have some very nice uh, 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 application. I like the, very much this uh, news because four years ago there was approved an artificial intelligence app to uh, diagnose a, um, a diabetic retinopathy from the image of the, the eyes. And the nice part was that it was accepted by FDA that there is no way for a second opinion. That is, if the app says, you have a problem, you have a problem. You don't need an, an expert to improve, to improve It was done in 2018. So this is really, really big time. Okay, so what we decided is to work on deep learning. Okay, so deep learning has half of here, the people know, half of people, but I think maybe most of you know, I will try to go a little bit fast. So what is a, deep, a neural network? That is the implementation for a deep learning model. In neural network, we have some kind of layers of neurons, these layers, the first layer receives the information from the image that is I can uh, codify and represent all the images as a row of pixels with their color. And then this goes to the first layer. This is processed, the process information goes to the second layer, the process information goes to the third layer, etc. When all this is first processed, it comes to the last layer. Okay. And the last layer contains as much neurons as classes you have. If I have 1,000 dishes, I will have 1,000 neurons in the last layer. And each neuron will say the probability to have spaghetti or pizza or cheesecake or whatever. And then what is the complex part here? The complex part is that we have a lot of weights here, okay? That is if I have one layer with 1,000 neurons and another layer with 1,000 neurons, 
how and I connect every neuron to every neuron. How many weights I have here? 1,000 by 1,000, 1 million. Only here. And 1 million and 1 million and 1 million. Okay? So the process of training that is in order to assure that the neuron corresponding to spaghetti is, is, that is, is higher by my neural network, that is if it recognizes well what is in the image, this process depends on the weight. So the process of training is how to change this weight so that when I pass the information, spaghetti is uh, higher, the spaghetti image higher than spaghetti neuron, right? And since we have millions and millions of parameters, that's why the process is, is slow, slow. Okay, so how we train, we compare what is the prediction with what is the ground truth on some training data set. We measure the difference, difference is measured by a loss function, and we try to optimize the, the parameters here so that the loss function is, is small. The, the, the smallest loss function, it means that prediction and ground truth correspond. And this is the process of backward propagation. And this is a, a very slow process because we have a lot of parameters. So if you go to, to the bibliography, you will find I, I don't say thousands, but at least hundreds of models. And you can use most of them for free. And the main difference is how do you combine this layer? So here in these layers, we can have some different operations. We can have the fully connected, but also we can have here, instead of having fully connected, we can have some layers that are implementing a convolution, another layer that is implementing a a, a thresholding that is called the relu, another uh, that is implementing a max operation, but they are all very si si uh, simple operations that are uh, applied by each of the layers. Okay? The main difference between different models is how do you uh, put it together these different uh, layers. Okay? So how many layers do you use? 100, 18, 50, or, or 1,000? Uh, how do you order them? Uh, but most of them, they are kind of, yeah, that is the information from one layer is passed to the next, is passed to the next, is passed to the next, and to that. Okay. Today, you have plenty of models. So if you want to work on deep learning, you can go and you can get several models and you can try your new problems. Here you can see that when we speak about neural networks, we should take into account how many operations they use. We should uh, take into account what accuracy we get and also how many parameters they have. So the biggest models doesn't mean that they have the best accuracy, okay? So we should really be clever in trying to get which could be the best models that I try to, to use, okay? And another thing that already has been uh, uh, seen is that sometimes uh, when you get an image, you process, you get the right answer, but then you introduce a little bit of noise and then the result is completely different. It means that because we have millions of parameters, we have a very sensible decision, okay? And that's why there is there are the adversarial networks, the generative adversarial networks that are trying to improve make the, uh, the neural networks more stable, okay? And how do they do? Uh, in this case, basic idea. So if I have, usually I have neural network, it has the initial layer, and then we have some layers, and, uh, and then the final result, okay? Uh, what we can do is we can add another part that is a random noise, and this part we create an image, okay? We, we try to fool our neural network. So we will be able to understand that this is a okay? So there will be one discriminator that is trying to create the real image, but then there is another part trying to fool. So, so this is basically the, 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 the,
So this is basically the idea that has been done in order to create synthetic data. So people from our group, uh, this is a friend, the group of uh, Karim Lekadir, uh, Oliver Diaz, and Richard Poussin as well, created a very nice public Medigan uh, uh, network uh, library. You can use it if you are interested. Um, uh, and um, you can generate a lot of different medical images. So these the guns were used on in order to create the deep fakes. Today, uh, I think deep fakes that is deep learning is getting much more known due, due to the deep fakes. Today, everybody knows already about deep learning because everybody knows about deep fakes, right? So the deep fakes, they basically the idea is okay. I can have instead of false and real images, I can have two domains, two domains, the first and the second one. Then the first domain, when I get a chorus, I will try to, to with my generator to create an image that is as close as possible to the, to the zebra. Okay? So my generator will create, and my discriminator here will try to separate between chords uh, uh, and zebra. But I can do in the opposite way. I can get zebras and try to apply a generator to create chords. And the horse discriminator will try to separate if it is horse from zebra. So in this way, what, what we are trying, what we are achieving is that when generators are good enough, in fact, when you get to zebra, it really generates a horse that, that is the closest horse to the zebra image I have. And this, has, this is the basic idea that is used in the big facts. Okay, so what makes the, the neural network so popular? First, because it is self-learning, we shouldn't think about how, what to, what, how to pre-process the data. Uh, no, we should put, we can put the raw data and then the neural network is learning what it is learning. The second part, it is model. That is, we can create different architectures. We can add a new layer. We can adapt, we can get the model and adapt to our problem, just changing the last layers. And we can also do transfer learning. And this is very important, especially for health applications, because in this way, we can transfer information from other domain to our domain. So the transfer learning is very well known because in the transfer learning, and for, for which especially neural networks are very good, is because we can get the model as we show there are plenty of models today existing that we can go and just get from the internet. These models, usually they're training by, uh, by big uh, well, companies or institutions with big computational resources and big, uh, on big training data sets. But the models are so good. So if I begin with this model and then apply in my domain where maybe I don't have so much data and I don't have so much computational resources, it still will work better than if I begin from scratch. If I initialize my weights, my millions of weights randomly, and begin training. Okay, so this is this property is called transfer learning. When so in transfer learning, we have always two domains, right? And first domain and the second domain. And this is called like fine tuning. So most of you that are already applied in some way deep learning, for, for sure 99% you did fine tuning, right? You got the model and then fine tune to your domain. So in this case, in the fine tuning way, you have some labels in the first domain, your training model, and then you apply to your domain. But this is not always the case. Maybe in some, some moment I have in the first domain, uh, I have labeled data, but in the second domain, I don't have any labeled data. I put all the images from the repository of the hospital, and then I want to see what is there, okay? Is the my neural network able to separate mammographies from, from, from ultrasound and from resonance images? 
you can have labels from the from your domain, but then you go and you get thousands of tons of images, millions of images in the net without any any label. Do you think this could be helpful? I will answer in a few seconds. You can have both domain and in both domains you have labels, or you can uh, miss labels in uh, in both domains. Okay. So transfer learning has been determined by Andrew Yang. I don't know if you have heard Andrew Yang. He's one of the fathers of deep learning. Uh, very nice uh, uh, courses in the internet on deep learning by Andrew Yang, the chief scientist of Baidu and professor of Stanford. So he, in five years ago in NIPS, one of the best conferences on machine learning, he already said that in 2016, Supervised learning is already in the industry. It's enough, saturated enough in order to be used in the industry. In five years, that is last year's, transfer learning will be some, uh, uh, mature enough in order to be used in industrial application. Meaning, next challenge is unsupervised learning. How to get used of the thousands and millions of images in the internet that I don't have any labels about them. How can I use them? So that's why today deep learning is everywhere. Internet, medicine, biology, media, entertainment, security, autonomous machines, etc. I was very surprised five years ago. I went to FNAC to buy a, 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 a TV. And there was a big poster, TV with deep learning. And I was, are the people, <laughs> this is a good argument of marketing for people to buy a TV because it has deep learning. I don't know. I was. Just surprised. But today, everybody speak about deep learning. In fact, you know Hype Gartner? Do you know the Hype Gartner? Yeah. yeah? If uh, somebody doesn't? So the hype cycle of, uh, uh, is showing the maturity of the technologies in general for whatever technologies, uh, emoji technology. So usually, uh, this is a law saying that always any technology first goes the, through the five phases. First is when you innovate, you register, there is a trigger always. Then there is the peak of maximum illusion, yeah, where we are uh, autonomous cars. And I already see myself with my own car that is uh, <laughs> driving me. Then we are disillusioned, yes, always the technology is so maybe this autonomous car will not as good bad for us as we expected. And then always there is the plateau, the slope of enlightenment that becomes productivity. So all the technologies, yeah, we, we create and other create, they pass through these different uh, phases. I don't know if you agree or not. And five years ago, well, no, four years ago, or almost five, yeah, five years ago, deep learning was on the hype cycle. So everybody was very excited. Today, deep learning is in the plateau of disillusion. So people are, it's not bad. What is coming next? And the, more, the most interesting thing is that usually this, this, this to me is the most interesting, this pit. This pit is really, really very short. You will not see so fast going through the different phases for the different technologies. Okay, now, uh, <laughs> My question is, and what are the questions there? As I mentioned, uh, and deep learning today is everywhere. A lot of people are working. So, uh, so what are what are the questions today? Today, if we we go and do yet another segmentation, yet another image classification, it's considered like problem solved. Don't do your PhD on image classification because it's considered that the problem is solved. The, but still, there are a lot of questions that we can do. So I want to try to do here uh, some list of uh, questions and challenges and, uh, and some ideas. Uh, for example, what uh, people are doing, and in our case, what we are doing, for example, in some of them. One of the big question is still on transfer learning. Yeah, As I mentioned, transfer learning is what you transfer uh, from other domains. And I, as I mentioned, there are different ways to apply transfer learning. 
But always we will do transfer learning, but which way we can do transfer learning in the most intelligent way, and it could be helpful. Then we should speak about uncertainty. And the certainty refers to the process of quantifying and managing uncertainty and ambiguity in the images, and especially for health application, this is crucial. Self-supervised learning. As I mentioned, if I have one million of images from internet without labels, are they useful? We will see. Meta learning. We are speaking about a lot of about lear learning, learning, learning. There should be also kind of meta learning that is explaining me how we learn and how models learn. And, uh, and this could help us to for faster adaptation to new tasks. Generative AI. We, we saw one example of GANs, but are, is there any other alternative for generative AI? And as you see, still a lot of trends, they don't, uh, and they are not, uh, I cannot put, couldn't put them in the same slide. Uh, efficiency and model compression. Okay, uh, uh, there was a growing interest in making deep learning models smaller, faster, and more ener ener energy efficient. So, uh, you know that uh, training one big deep learning algorithm is polluting more than one car for years. You know this? So definitely it's not a question of training by training. We really need to do training in a much wiser way. And we need, really need to have models that are not in unnecessarily complex. Yeah. So sh shall we go for sure with a layer with a neural network of 100 uh, layers, or maybe smaller could be better. Multimodal learning how to combine different data. Today we are in the, in the century of uh, large language models, but can we combine large language models and text and, and images and audio? Can, when you go to the, to the hospitals, more and more our physicians are also using multimodal data, images, clinical data, uh, genomics data, et cetera, et cetera. Federated learning, big question, especially very important for, uh, for health. The question here is, okay, shall I get all the data from all the hospitals from the same to the same place to process? Is there a way to decentralize my model, my uh, training process so that each hospital doesn't uh, send any, anywhere uh, their, uh, their data and in this way, especially uh, uh, um, control very much uh, all the problems of data protection. And also a lot of publication for healthcare. So all this is considered like open trends in deep learning. I will try to give a few ideas. We will not go because we are maintaining the very going very fast. I will give you any ideas what we have been doing and what we are doing. I most of them we choose, we still are in the food image analysis, but not the only one. Why did we choose food? Because it is complete, very, very complex domain. If I get some, if I work on CIFAR 10 or CIFAR 100, it is so known public data set. So there is no secret there. <laughs> but if you really get a complex uh, domain, so you will have all the problems and you will have a very nice uh, advances. So here we have all these questions, how to do data centric uncertainty modeling, how to do um, uh, learning with noisy labeling, self-supervising generative AI, large scale food recognition, food ontology. And let me give you a few ideas about what we are doing. For example, <laughs> when we speak about classification, so when I ask here a question, what is in this image? What's the food? In fact, the question, the problem is in the question, not in the answer, because there is not only one question. There are many, many answers. That is in, because there are many questions. The question is, what is the but am, am I asking about the category? Am I asking about the ingredients? Am I asking about the dish? Am I asking about the cuisine? Right? So this is called multitask learning. When we have several problems that you solve on the same image, right? And this is, well, not only typical for food, for this is uh, for, for most of the image analysis. The question here is that it has been shown that if you solve several problems together, you will always get your models that are much better that, than if you first solve first question, then the second question, then the third question, then the fourth. And this is a kind of also transfer learning because different tasks, they are correlated. So they help each other. 
And in this way, your models are much more efficient and accurate and combining all tasks reduces computation because at the end you will have one model, not four models. And it will generalize better because we are not too much specific to only one question, but you solve different questions altogether. So there are very nice models you can combine. You have different models in neural networks that you combine because remember we say that neural networks are very modular. You can easily combine these kind of architectures in order to solve different problems. And in this case, results are much, much better. For example, we here you see that you can even recognize ingredients uh, because the dish is helping the task, the dish is helping to the task of ingredients. Uncertainty, uncertainty is critical for health applications. Sometimes we have always this question, why doesn't my model work? Why doesn't my model train? Um, why my, doesn't my model will learn? But sometimes also you have the problem, why does my model work? Because sometimes the algorithms are so good and the results are so nice, but, and why? Why, how is it that he, what does my model know and what doesn't know? Uh, so how can we know if model predict this and not that? And um, still neural networks are black boxes. And this is one of the big questions, very big uh, problems for model, black, uh, for, for neural networks. So there are a lot of um, uh, research today because also GDPR obliges us to have explainable models. That is, we physicians cannot apply a neural network if the neural network is not able to explain their decision. But it is not only important to explain and what does it mean to explain, but it is also very important to explain, to give the uncertainty of the decision. So it's not the same when a physician says, when a physician, a physician uses a model and model says, okay, I see here a tumor with um, uncertainty of uh, 5%. I see tumor with uncertainty of 50%. Of course, this is very diff different, right? So. Uh, noise is always in observations, noise and uh, in annotations. Noise, we cannot have the whole complete coverage of the domain. We will never have all the observations in tra to train our data. That's why we do training, validation and test. We always have systematic bias in our data. Our models are imperfect. They are never 100% good, but some of them are still useful. And that's why we should also work on the uncertainty. And when we speak about uncertainty, we should think about epistemic or aleatoric. Epistemic is if the uncertainty is coming from the model or aleatoric if it is coming from the data. And there is a lot of research on this, how, what, how to estimate the uncertainty, how to use it. Uh, so if you are interested, uh, just tell me uh, and, and so we speak about this. And the other thing is that Still, our machine learning model, they never say, sorry, I don't know. They always give some, some this is one neuron is hiring. That there is the, 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 the winner neuron. So our model still can, can be improved. Uh, what we can do is what we did here is what we saw is that the uncertainty is very important to make the models wiser. And for example, when we are solving different multitask problems, we, it's important not only the precision, the accuracy of the different models, but also in certain. Because if some of the tasks are very noisy, are very uncertain, they can contaminate the other task. So you using the uncertainty in order to weigh the different tasks and how the error is not propagated is something that is very useful to improve the algorithm. So this is, for example, one way to use uh, aleatoric uncertainty for our model. Let me skip this but to save some <laughs> seconds. Another question that is very important. Uh, how many people of you are using supervised learning? Okay. Uh, what do you think if uh, you find a model that is, or you read a paper that where the model uh, it has precision 99% or 98%? Do you believe it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So there is study showing in the bibliography that if you get a, all public data sets 
and you measure the error in the annotations, you will have 3.4% on average error. So if you read the paper that is getting 99%, be suspicious. But here you can see, for example, the well-known image net. Uh, so for example, it says it's monkey. This says it is a cat. And this is says this is a beaver, et cetera, et cetera. So every, every public data set, he has an error. And why is this? Because annotations are done by humans. And humans always uh, have errors. We are never perfect, right? So it makes sense also to have our models to be intelligent enough in order to take into account that our data from where they train also can have errors. So for example, here, this is a one, one work we, are, we have done and it was presented uh, to the IBPRA got the best paper and this is a master's student. So I was, I'm really very <laughs> blessed that uh, also, uh, also young people uh, can do very nice, uh, nice work. So here, what we did is uh, we, if we, because we know that uh, always there will be errors. So what we do is we have two neural networks is called Siamese and each of these makes prediction of which could be the right data training data, which could be the error. So if you try to classify and you see that the likelihood is very low. So you say, okay, for this, the neural network doesn't know it or most probably this is erroneous. Mm -hmm. So if I focus on the correct, correctly to type, uh, certainly classify, and then I use this like a label because I dub their labels, but I make that the other model try to classify in the correct way the, the this unlabeled data and then interchange information. So in this way, in fact, we improve it uh, and we got very, very nice results. Good, generative AI and guns. So neural networks, they have millions of parameters. So they are dragons, where they can do a lot of things, but they are greedy dragons. They have a lot of, they need a lot of data. So how do we assure millions of data? What do you do? Data augmentation, right? That you get the image, you rotate it, you translate it, you deform it, you change a little bit uh, the error. And then if I, from this image, I, uh, they did these 10 operations, automatically I multiply by 10 my data, right? The point is that sometimes also, this is not easy just for from this to have because I didn't change so much the content, so I need to go for more data. What can I do if I need to go for more data? I go for synthetic data. Okay, so guns are very nice. Here, for example, we created artificial cakes, artificial <laughs> um, salads, artificial um, pizza. For example, you get this image pizza and you convert it to a spaghetti, uh, et cetera, et cetera. No, if I can do Obama and Obama, I can do spaghetti versus pizza. Uh, and then I create a lot of synthetic data. Now, uh, how can I generate this synthetic data from, from the original images? If I do even data augmentation or if I go to read the data. Also, remember, data-centric approach. It is very important what are the data. Okay, so I can make you a very short illustration. If I here have two classes and my classifiers say this, and here I will have some hard samples and some outliers. I, if I get this data and do data augmentation, where will be the new data distributed? Where well, most data, right? If I get my data and do synthetic data, synthetic or from this, so I do the data augmentation, most probably they will be here. So it means that using just uh, uh, this, this data augmentation, simple data augmentation, not helped me. What I really want is to, to help to this that are badly or very uncertain data. So what we can do again, use the uncertainty in order to create these samples and improve the models. Also, uh, we, when we speak about generative AI, we shouldn't 
think only about guns. Guns is something that is already you know, uh, uh, um, uh, old. Uh, but uh, there are many other also uh, techniques that are going on, like uh, uh, nerves and, uh, and uh, uh, diffusion, stable diffusion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So also we are working on nerves. And in fact, last week there was a hackathon here in Barcelona Supercomputing. So uh, 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 our group was uh, using here, uh, presenting in a hackathon to use this, what we call moments nerve in order to create a different representation from few images. Okay, uh, let's go. Self-supervised learning. Um, by the way, how how much time shall we cut it? Five minutes. Okay, uh, so I just want to show other questions. I will not speak about the answers. Then uh, another question here is about the self-supervised learning. As I mentioned, it's what to do when we have thousands of image data that are not labeled. This is a very active research. In fact, Lekun, maybe you know him. He, the, uh, he was doing a talk on how important is self-supervised learning. And in fact, with self-supervised learning, uh, today, algorithms are even better than supervised learning. And the idea here is to try to use data that are not labeled to improve the, 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 your supervised learning. So if you are interested, go and see this uh, talk. Very interesting, very nice. Also, uh, uh, analogy with neuroscientists, <laughs> neuroscientists showing that in fact, we humans also do self-supervised learning. That is, when you think about the baby, baby for a few months, and this baby should learn the word. Uh, and maybe the mother says, okay, this is car, this is father, etc." But the, the, the baby doesn't have all, already the ch communication channel. So the baby should manage a lot of data in an unsupervised way. And then to put together with the, 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 the semantics, the data that uh, the, the baby acquires uh, communicating with uh, his family. So it has been shown by neuroscientists that in our uh, brain also, we have some of the pro information is super, uh, so, uh, processed in an unsupervised way. And some of the processes of, uh, of, uh, process in a super, supervised way. And, and then we take the decision. Very nice talk, have a look on this, uh, if you are interested, of course. So what we do is we have the data, a lot of data that are not supervised, but what I know is that if I have a doc and I do some transformation of this doc, the content is the same. So I want that my model, whatever it says, when I transform the image, it should say the same that shouldn't change the, the information. Okay, so this is uh, some work online we presented just two weeks ago in ICCV, uh, this, this model, they're trying and put some transformers, but I will not go into the depth. The, this is, um, uh, but there, a lot of things are going on self-supervised learning. Continual learning is another trend, very interesting. Continual learning is, okay, if I already have a lot of, uh, 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 knowledge that I acquired in different domains, I don't have any more the data. But then I go to a new domain. How can I learn the new domain without forgetting what I learned in the previous domain? And this is called continual learning. So here, for example, we again, we use the uncertainty in order to improve the continual learning and to find when we have out of distribution data. So basically the idea is when I have the previous domain, I can estimate not only the probability, but the uncertainty. And then I go to the new domain, I want to keep for the new domain, but also for the old domain, big precision and small uncertainty. So this is basically the idea. Just question what uh, uh, we are working. Another big question for us is, scaling for example when we speak about food how many classes of food there are how many food do you think there are 
According to the Wikipedia, just 200,000. Do you know any classifier that is able to classify 200,000 classes? Not for the moment. So how to solve this problem and how many images do we need in order to, to train a classifier of 200,000 classes? This is a big question. So we should think about some wiser solutions because the bigger also, the bigger the classifier, uh, uh, the bigger number of classes, also the precision drops automatically, of course. So here, for example, what we did is trying to simplify the problem. That is for sure, if I'm here, the probability to go and to eat food from Nigeria is very slow, very low. So what we can do is we can separate the problem in sub-problems and have some specified problems, um, uh, classifiers from the different cuisines, and then, and, then, and then take the decision. But this I can do if I'm really very, very sure for, for my, for my cuisine classification, because if I, uh, uh, I don't know if I um, have an error on the cuisine, then for sure I will never uh, uh, recognize the food. So again, the uncertainty can help us to, to assure how good is this uh, Fine grain recognition. Also another problem is that many of them classes, when we speak about 1000 of classes, for sure some of the classes will be very, very close each other. So how to do when we have fine grain recognition? For example, how do you separate this from this, from this, from this? So again, because our neural networks are very modular, we can combine different, that is, we can have classifiers that are focused on some parts of the space and uh, be very good locally, and then we can combine these classifiers. Um, explainable AI, critical. So when we do when we do whatever, our model should be able to explain. There are some works already that are at least showing which part of the image have been done, have been using in order to say uh, what uh, what our neural network used to to classify my uh, problem. Uh, this, for example, what we did is just an anecdote, very very fast when we. Uh, um, uh, decided to work on, on COVID because we were staying at home and we decided, no, we should help to the civilization, so <laughs> to the planet to save. And then we begin to working on COVID, trying to recognize the COVID version of COVID. And there were, our model was arriving to 75 and it was not improving anyway. So we asked it, okay, what is my model using in order to classify a lesion of COVID versus, versus no COVID? And we saw that in fact, my classifier was focusing on the background, <laughs> even no question. So we say, oh, this is not the right way. So this is, that's why it's very important to see what our uh, algorithm is doing. Okay, success story, very few words. Uh, this is where we applied on a European project for elderly in order to help them improve their nutrition. This is another project for kidney transplant. Uh, um, um, patients because for them the nutrition before and after the operation is very, very important to reduce the probability of rejection of the new organ. This is another project uh, also for diabetic people. Um, this is another project uh, where with a company, very nice a TED talk uh, explaining uh, how to use serious gaming, uh, this serious game in order to improve healthy lifestyle. Um, and, uh, and this is also another project that is going to this moment. And uh, this is from the Research Kaisha, where we are using single cell uh, in order to analyze Huntington disease. Uh, we are using the mixed data in order to construct the trajectory of evolution of the cells and see at what moment the trajectory begin to uh, uh, evolve in, 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 in wrong way in order to invert the process, okay? So we are using here our cell rank in order to find where, where the, the, here, for example, this is the initial cells and then how they evolve. And, and the next step will be at what time they bifurcate, right? In order to see when the Huntington disease begins. And then and our last uh, slide, this is what we are uh, also working at, just very uh, new project on multimodal data. 
So these are the people from hospital clinic. They are interested in the neck and larynx cancer. This is very, very underexplored problem. They have a lot of data. They have videos, they have CT, they have uh, clinical data, pathological data, PET scans, etc. But they have never used them together. And uh, this is a project we are working. And the most I'm proud is that all this that we are doing is very good uh, professional opportunity for young people to continue their professional uh, life out of the university. Like for example, this uh, this um, uh, Mark here, here you see as uh, 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 Alfonso mentioned, he did a company using his uh, work on his PhD in order to exploit this uh, uh, software for nutrition analysis. So the company created the smart kiosk. So when you go to the to the to the uh, uh, restaurant, you shouldn't wait for the on the queue. It, uh, you put just the tray and it uh, recognizes automatically the food and also an uh, app for to, uh, to monitor the nutrition. Last uh, slide, open questions. Still a lot of work. Still we have a lot of open questions. Um, I, the community on deep learning is really growing. It is uh, exponentially growing. Um, just to mention last ICCV, there were 8,000 registered. So it was really good before it happened only in the clinical and uh, conferences. Uh, question. Still a lot of questions about how to have robust deep learning models and how to assure that uh, they are uh, robust against adversarial attacks, how to make them generalizable, how to understand how gen the models generalize from training data to unseen data. Few shot and zero shot learning, we didn't have time but it is another way of transfer learning where you get a model and only from few new images, you are able to learn into to the new domain. That is when, when you show to a baby uh, one picture of a zebra or then the baby already knows that this is a zebra. Meta learning, as we mentioned, interpretable model, memory and reasoning, how to assure what is reasoning and how to get information about how the model is reasoning energy efficiency and data efficiency, how to make models to be able to learn without a huge amount of data. Continual learning, we mentioned multimodal and cross-model learning, how to create hybrid models and how to assure ethical and fair learning. So thank you very much. Just, I should say that uh, it's a very amazing to me field. Uh, and for me, this, this sentence that is, has been created from Confucius <laughs> so many centuries ago uh, is still valid. So this, my lesson is choose a job you love and you will never have a worker day in your life. Thank you very much. With the, you mean the cells, yeah. Um, you know that in the self-supervised learning, you have the, the, you have the unsupervised and supervised, right? So always at the end, you will have the supervised learning in the new domain, in the next, but the, and the problem, the, 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 the challenge in the self-supervised let me go. Okay, here. Okay, so I will have these data that are non supervised, okay? And I want to have a model that is robust enough. And what does it mean, robust? So if I have an image and I transform this image, whatever was the decision before, it should be the same, right? So this is the, the idea of the self-supervised learning. So once I have a good model, then I go to the supervised part. 
but it's not the same to begin with whatever model than to begin with already robust model, right? So the explainability is the same again because you will do the explainability here, right? It's, but uh, but you just begin from a much better model. Okay. I don't want to read up. I am super excited that you are coming to the party. And my question is because you explained a lot about the questions, but you left us like a little bit about the answers. Can you tell us like one answer that you know you are most excited about in this career trajectory that you have? You know, that you use deep learning and you would like. Wow. Okay. <laughs> like I could or at least that was that you could not anticipate. Uh, no, uh, everything, uh, no, no, no secrets, <laughs> no secrets. Uh, it's very, very difficult to say what's my favorite. Uh, my answer is a meta answer. That is, to, to me, as you see, um, the, the big challenge is that I, I wouldn't prioritize, prioritize one of the, 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 the direction, but I consider that the nice part is here to have better model to have solution of more complex questions, and uh, and this you can find in almost every field. Right. The the point is that um, maybe as I mentioned, it is that uh, uh, how to find these new challenges, new field where still the technology is not there. Like for example, in this the Laring, uh, uh project where we have a lot of information, a lot of questions and physicians, they, they still don't have the right protocol. They get Friday every day, every Friday, and they put all the kinds of images and they, they discuss, etc. But but the, the, to me, the challenge is this, to have a robust model and to solve real problems. So this is my challenge. <laughs> so, but uh, every, every question here is interesting uh, and, and worth to work, yeah, yeah. Thank you. One more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.